Uh, before I uh, get started today on the podcast, I'm going to talk about something. Uh, I found this piece of paper the other day. Now, uh, if if you know me, you know that I, I'm, I'm, I'm a note taker. Uh, I, I, I take notes about everything constantly. But what I liked about this note was this is uh, this was my little uh, sheet that I used at the RKC2, the second level of the uh, kettlebell certifications, when we came out to the area on ballistic overhead work. There's two exercises, the kettlebell um, push press and the kettlebell push jerk. And when we do the RKC2 or, or any of the advanced certs, I always run into a big issue right away. I'll, I'll talk about the issue real quick and then move on. A couple of years ago, somebody emailed me with the, the new schedule and they said, you know, so proudly, well, what do you think? And I said, well, you know, as the team leader, you're asking me to put my group through 14 different tests in a two or three day period. And now it's just two. Well, testing people on 14 t different movements, and some of them were redundant, yes. But one of them was the five minute snatch test, which is five minutes for every participant. Um, pull-ups, uh, we had a pistol in there. We had all kinds of, we had a whole bunch of non-kettlebell exercises. And I just thought, you know, you're asking me to not only teach for two days, but also judge a decathlon, well, actually more than a decathlon over the two day period. I'm still a believer that the advanced kettlebell cert should only have two tests. Uh, and this, we talked about this back well over a decade ago. And the two tests uh, that set you up in the book, Enter the Kettlebell, uh, the idea is this. There's, there's two things you should do. Now, I'm going to use them for the male standards, and the female are just a little different. But in a 10-minute period, you should be able to snatch the 24-kilo bell 200 times. And then, and I think you should be able to do both in a half an hour period, press half body weight with one hand overhead. And so for most of the men I work with, that would be the beast. So you snatch the 24 200 times in 10 minutes, and then press the beast. And people said, well, that's really hard. And I thought, yeah, it's really hard, but it would show that you were, you, you had a high level of strength, endurance, and throwing every other word you want to throw in. Uh, obviously, my simple solution uh, was passed over. But when we get to these certs, we have a lot of these exercises we teach, and I spend a lot of time before I teach everyone with the section I called mythos, uh, which is the why of things. Why do you do this exercise? And what's interesting is that this is my sheet right here for the overhead ballistic work. Uh, and it starts off with mythos, the why. The, the first thing I always ask people to do, if, if you have a client or yourself, if you can't do kettlebell swings because of whatever reason, and, or, you cannot do uh, Turkish get-ups uh, with one arm in, uh, uh, on, with both arms, both sides. We shouldn't even be discussing anything ballistic or anything overhead yet. Uh, if you have an injured back, I don't want to see you doing ballistic overhead work. If your knees are bad, I don't want to see you doing ballistic overhead work. If it hurts for you to roll on the ground for a moment, maybe we don't want to do ballistic overhead work. So I put this little matrix in here. Uh, if you can do swings and, and Turkish get-ups right and left, then I say, and it says yes, then the next question is this. Do you need ballistic overhead work? And there's a good question. Because if you don't, like if you're an NFL football player who's getting plenty of uh, uh, ballistic work in the game or you're uh, in a, a, a other different sports where maybe overhead stability isn't your best thing, I would still say no. Now, if you're at the cert and you're required to do it because of testing, then we would say yes. So I always put these little matrices for my students in the beginning because one of the things I think we don't always do when it comes to exercises is, I mean, it's, it's a cliche as old as I am, I mean, older than, older than the mountains. You got to look before you leap. So one of the things when you do bring in new exercises to your clients or to your own training program, always take a moment to ask that why question. Well, I always do that. And one of the things I'm constantly trying to do is come up with better ways 
to come up with a why question. Uh, if you know my work, I'm not a huge fan of the phrase either or. But when it comes to exercise selection, I like that a lot. If you want to do my Olympic lifting programs, uh, really there's a big first one. Do you have an Olympic lifting bar? Because if you don't, you can't do them. I hate to be so either or is so binary, but that's just the way it goes. When we come to working with the more advanced lifts in the world of barbells or the kettlebells, hey, and it'd be true in gymnastics and every other thing we do, there are times you have to stop and say, do we have the equipment? Do we have the knowledge? If you go to the university and go to the workout generator, you'll find we have five or six questions on, on, on this. And then there's that other one is, do you need to do this exercise? And I gotta tell you folks, that's the one that I have been probably pushing the most in the last few decades. Yes, it's a great exercise, but do you need to do it? Are there simpler, safer things you can do besides this? Uh, I remember years ago, I wouldn't say we got into a fight, but uh, I got into a disagreement with a, with a, a fellow track coach who felt that the entire track program should be doing plyometrics. And of course, I, I cited the research about plyometrics. I shared my experiences with plyos. And, and frankly, uh, with a lot of the kids we have in the modern high school, uh, they need much lower end stuff than plyometrics. Many of them are carrying a lot of excess tissue on their body, and it's not muscle. And, um, you know, doing box jumps with uh, an obese athlete, I don't see that as a good thing. And it was interesting because this assistant coach wanted to go right up to the, some of the most elite techniques in track and field and was skipping over the basics like appropriate techniques. Like this, uh, th this coach's athletes weren't doing uh, full turns in the discus, which, of course, is a big deal. They were doing standing throws in the javelin, which is a big deal. All the plyometrics in the world aren't nearly as good as having proper technique. So it's a thought I want you to uh, run with a little bit. I want you to think about the why of your exercise selection sometimes. And if you can, find appropriate other things to do that might fit where you are now. I always say this. I, in fact, last week I was Olympic lifting again. I'm very proud of that at my age. Um, but now when I Olympic lift, it's the cherry on top of a number of weeks of building up my, my joints, flex, my joint mobility, my flexibility, my capacity to handle the Olympic lifts. And then I do them again for a while and then I get away from them and bring back other things and bring myself back to the Olympic lifts. I think it's intelligent. I think it's appropriate. And it's something I can do for a long, long time. I hope this helps.